okay, I, I could see I'm married. All right. So all the commissioners are here. Yes. So with that, I would like to call to order the January 18th, 2022 Montgomery County Board of County Commissioner meeting. Thank you guys for joining us via Zoom. I know this is a little different. Um, our first time doing it full Zoom, but we appreciate everybody's flexibility. So to get us started, I would like Mary Hassel, if you would lead us in a prayer, please, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you that you um, incline your ear to us, Father, that you are mindful of us. Lord, we pray that um, you would give us wisdom as county leaders to make decisions that um, not only honor you, Lord, but are the best um, decisions for the citizens of our county. Father, we pray that you would um, guide us in um, the directions that we should go, Lord, and um, in the things that we should be about, Lord, and we just praise you for always um, being there for us and always being good. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We will move forward too with our Pledge of Allegiance. Unfortunately, here in my office at the Mercantile, I do not have a flag. But if you guys would pretend there's a flag in the background, um, and if you would join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, I would appreciate it. So, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the flag to the flag of the, of United, the United States, States of, America. of America and to the, to the Republic. Republic. For which it which stands, it stands one, nation, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Thank you. Now, I will share because we have presenters on there. So as you see names on your screen and faces, um, the county commissioners, there are four that is on this meeting tonight. So there's me, Dana Dawson. You have Franchon Robinson. You have John Shaw. And then you have, it says, I, Mary. So Mary Hassel. So we are your Board of County Commissioners. Um, so glad to have you here tonight. To get us started also, I do need to have a motion to approve our agenda as written. So if I can have a motion, please. I make a motion, we approve the agenda. All right, Mary Hassel with a motion and a second. A second. And Kay Robinson, second. Any opposed? So then our agenda is approved. Next topic on our agenda is our consent agenda. We have multiple items on the consent agenda. We've had this. I think everyone is familiar with all the pieces that are on here. Is there any questions about anything on consent before we move forward? If no questions, I do need a motion to approve the consent agenda. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Thank you, John. John Shaw with a motion. A second? A second. Mary Hassel with a second. Any opposed? Nope. So then the consent agenda is approved. Next, we do have two presentations this, this evening, so I'm not sure who is presenting for whom, uh, but our first presentation tonight is our fiscal, 20, fiscal year 21 financial audit. So Frankie, is there any introductions you need to make or just turn it directly over to those guys? Very briefly, um, our fiscal year ending 21 audit is being presented tonight by Malden and, Jen Malden and Jenkins. Tim Lyons is the uh, principal accountant there. Uh, Cynthia Bigger is also uh, joining us um, who will be making comment to the board. They have a presentation here for you and will be available for questions. And in a nutshell, the audit is the county's financial report card for the year. So uh, Tim, Cynthia, I'll turn it over to you guys. Thanks, Frankie, I appreciate that introduction. I, <clears throat> just, to, just to confirm, everyone can hear me okay? Audio is good. Yep. All right, great. Um, I, I do have some PowerPoint slides and I, um, I just tried to share my screen, but it's saying that the um, screen sharing is disabled because uh, of who's hosting the meeting. So I don't know if we wanna try and make me a co-host so I can share my screen. If not, um, I can certainly just try to um, present without the, oh wait, there we go. I see it. Yep, um, click, um, on the, uh, <laughs> quick, click on the, quick, uh, quick on the, quick on the, on the zoom controls. So, okay. So everybody can, can see my screen. 
Um, <clears throat> great. So we'll get started. I know you'll have a full agenda tonight. Um, certainly don't want to take any more time than is necessary, but um, briefly, we'll just kind of go over the engagement team, which Frankie kind of already introduced us uh, to y'all. We'll go over the results of the audit. Um, we've got a slide and just a couple, you know, kind of a few financial uh, trends to look at, um, you know, focusing mostly on the county's general fund as the chief operating fund, probably the fund that's the most important to the county and to the board. Um, some comments, recommendations, and some other uh, items, and and certainly I've got a spot down there for questions at the end. But uh, if anybody has a question, right, you know, feel free to uh, ask away or to stop me as I'm going through the presentation tonight. Um, <clears throat> just by way of kind of reintroductions, I know uh, this is the you know this is really the first year we've had a chance to come before y'all and present the audit to the board. Um, this is our second year of working with the county. Um, you know, as we, I got a slide on there, you know, about, about Malden and Jenkins, I mean, really uh, serving government, serving, serving local governments throughout the Southeast is, is something that is really a big part of what we do. And we're uh, excited and appreciate the opportunity to be a service to Montgomery County. Um, just by way of reiterating, um, you know, my name is Tim Lyons and I served as the engagement partner on the county's audit. Um, the county's audit is based out of our Columbia, South Carolina office, which is where I predominantly practice. Um, although I do have about uh, about 15 governments in the state of North Carolina that I work with on an annual basis, including five other counties. So uh, Cynthia Bigger, who is also on the call with me tonight, is a senior associate with uh, with M and J, um, and she served as kind of the in charge and sort of ran the day to day uh, of the county's audit, working very closely with Amber uh, and other you know parts of the county to uh, accomplish all that we have to accomplish as far as performing the financial and the compliance audit. And then um, every one of our uh, audits goes through what we call an engagement quality control review. So when we get done, when we get finished, when Cynthia and I wrap up, we send everything over to another partner in our governmental practice who uh, has no other involvement, uh, no other uh, role with the county's audit to make sure that we've done everything we need to do. We've dotted every I, we've crossed every T. Um, and that was a, a gentleman by the name of Trey Scott, who um, actually did the county's uh, quality control review last year as well. So um, that's your engagement team uh, for the county's 2021 audit. Just, you know, to, to remind everybody and make sure we're kind of all on the same page with what kind of audit we're talking about. This is the audit of the county's financial statements. Uh, those financial statements are the responsibility of the county's management and our responsibility as the independent external auditors is to come in and audit them and express an opinion uh, on those financial statements. Uh, that second bullet point there, our report on the county's financial statements, we issued an unmodified, uh, which is just a fancy auditing term uh, for a clean opinion. Um, there's no higher or better opinion that you can get. So we had a, a clean opinion on the county's financial statements. And so what that means is that when you look at the financial report, it is considered to present fairly in all material respects, the county's net position, the county's fund balance, its results of operations and its cash flows for the fiscal year ended June 30, uh, 2021. We are also responsible as part of our uh, audit on the, of the county uh, for issuing, uh, there's, there's actually three additional reports that are contained in the compliance section at the back of the county's audit. The first one is our report on internal controls over financial reporting that is required by government auditing standards. We issued that report. We did have one finding to report this year, and I'm going to go over that in just a few minutes. And we, um, we did have no instances of non-compliance, though. We are required to perform tests of the county's compliance with certain laws, regulations, contracts, those types of things. We had no instances of non-compliance that were noted in the report uh, uh, on internal controls over financial reporting. The second and third report that we have to issue are uh, kind of part of the reporting package of what is known as the single audit. Uh, as the recipient of uh, federal and state funding, the county is required to undergo a single audit when the county spends more than $750,000 of federal expenditures or more than $500,000 of state expenditures. We're required to go through a risk-based uh, selection process that we, where we identify what are known as major programs that we are required to audit. This year, we had six programs we needed to audit. Uh, at the federal level, we audited Medicaid. We audited the county's expenditures of its coronavirus relief funds, uh, and we audited the county's USDA loans that were um, the, the permanent financing for the new high school. We also, from a state level, audited the um, Department of Environmental Quality revolving loan program, some of the projects going on in the public utilities fund. 
the foster care and guardianship program, and the One North Carolina Fund. So those were the programs we had to audit. And both at the federal level, which is one report, and the state level, which is the second report, we issued uh, we issued a unmodified or a clean opinion on compliance for each uh, major program. And we had no uh, material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal control over compliance. So very, very clean compliance reports uh, for the county's single audits this year. The next couple of slides are what are kind of known in the in the audit is you know audit world as the required communications. We have submitted these to the county in writing, and so I'm not going to go through and read every single one of these. But I do think you know as somebody who sits on uh, a, a couple of boards myself, um, I, I do think that there are some of these that are important for for the for for the the those charged with governance to hear directly from the external auditor. So. Um, the first bullet point there about significant accounting policies, I think what's important to point out here, um, and this kind of encompasses that second one too about management judgments and accounting estimates, is that uh, in, in order to prepare financial statements uh, in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, which is the kind of the standard setting that we have to follow, <clears throat> we have management makes estimates. There are some judgments that have to go into useful lives of capital assets, the allowance for accounts receivable. There's a lot of actuarial assumptions that go into the pension and OPEB uh, information that's in the county's financial reports. And, and basically, as a part of our audit, we look at all of those estimates, we look at those uh, assumptions. And I think what I'd like to point out and communicate to the board is that the, the county has not taken any sort of a aggressive uh, accounting positions. There are no transactions that the county has that are outside of authoritative guidance or maybe we're not maybe the county's gotten itself involved in some sort of a controversial or emerging issue none of that is present all of the county's uh, estimates that we uh, that we have in there that we audit are, are very comparable and consistent with what we see at other counties across the state of north carolina relationship with management uh, is another thing that i'll always like to point out we received full cooperation from the county's management and staff you know, okay, so what does that mean? It sounds like you guys kind of, you know, does that mean you guys were like buddy, buddy working together? Um, what, what that means is that when we were going through our audit process, uh, of course, we, we pick samples and we request a ton of documentation. We, we need to speak with uh, people from all kinds of different departments, uh, people who are over uh, programs, people who are over finance. And so in doing all of those things, Management was fully cooperative with us. They got the documentation that we asked for. We had access to everybody we needed to talk to. So full cooperation for management, I think, is an important thing uh, for uh, the board to know. And then last but not least, uh, our, our independence. I think, you know, it's always good for the auditor uh, to point out to the board that, you know, we, we have to be independent of the county uh, in order to uh, render an opinion on the county's financial statements as the independent CPA. Not only do we meet all of the professional ethical standards that we have to by the AICPA, but because we performed those single audits that I was talking about a minute ago, um, we have to be independent in accordance with government auditing standards, which are actually even a bit more stringent than just the normal AICPA professional ethical standards. We meet all those uh, requirements and we fulfill the requirements to say that we truly are independent of the county and thus can express an opinion on the county's financial statements. As I mentioned before, one slide on fund balance, I think this is a good slide to kind of point out. Um, I think <clears throat> uh, as, a, as a county, I think Montgomery County should be uh, proud of its general fund. When you look at the general fund's fund balance, so when we, when we talk about fund balance, we're talking about kind of what's, what's left over. So we've got, we've got assets, we've got our cash, receivables, uh, prepaid items, our inventory, those types of things, minus our liabilities, our accounts payable, accrued payroll, you know, all those other things that we have to, to, to true up and record at year end. And fund balance is kind of what's left over. And the, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, or the GASB, requires us to break up fund balance into, uh, you know, multiple different, different categories. Um, the, the main ones here, that, that green chunk you'll see that kind of fluctuates between about 9 and 10 percent of fund balance, that is what is known as restricted for state stabilization. The state of North Carolina requires you to do a calculation every year where uh, essentially you can't appropriate for spending that portion of fund balance that is not cash, uh, unrestricted cash or unrestricted investments. And I think this is a good trend to see that over time, 
the county's restricted for state stabilization has, has stayed relatively consistent over the last five years. What that means is that we're not spending down all of our cash. We have, you know, we don't have a, a, a huge number of fund balance that is maybe, you know, uh, maybe in accounts receivable, that's maybe in uh, due to uh, other funds where we're lending money back and forth between other funds. The general fund's cash position is staying relatively consistent over time, which is a good trend to see. And then the other big, you know, big chunk here, that, that blue um, box there is your unassigned fund balance. And so we have, we have restricted fund balance, which is where outside, you know, whether it's by law, by regulation, has restricted what we can spend that money on. Then we've got committed and assigned fund balance, which is where we, as our, you know, the committed is by the board, assigned is by management. We've placed constraints on how we're going to use some of those funds. The blue part is the unassigned. That's what's left over. That's what the county has available for spending at its discretion. And that unassigned fund balance is about 60% of the county's annual expenditures, which, you know, which is well in, in excess of what the state requires you to have as a minimum. And it's, you know, the GFOA, which is the Government Finance Officers Association, would typically recommend that you have, you know, about 25 to 30% just to protect yourselves from fluctuations in revenue streams from changing in the timing of when, you know, revenues come in, which you know, the last two years, there's been a lot of uncertainty about that with, you know, COVID and everything else. So the county's fund balance, unassigned fund balance and the general fund, a very healthy position there. Um, and so those are all kind of positive things to look at when we're looking at fund balance of the general fund at June 30th of 2021. The next couple slides are just what, you know, are, are kind of recommendations from the audit. This first one, revenue recognition and maintenance of related balance sheet accounts. Um, as I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago about our, our uh, report on internal controls over financial reporting, we did have one finding that we had to report this year. Now, when we hear the word finding, obviously that kind of raises our, our radar. It sounds bad. Uh, I wish that in some ways in the audit world, I wish we had a better word for some of that, but, um, but what, Really what happened and what we talk about on these slides here is that um, the, the government auditing standards, which we have to follow, that's the report that we're issuing, they have really tied our hands as auditors um, by what we can and can't do to help out uh, any one of our audit clients, and in this case, the county, with making sure that the numbers at year end are reported correctly. And essentially what they've said is that when we, when we make adjustments, we have to evaluate those adjustments against our various materiality thresholds um, because we have to be independent of the county. We can't help the county with uh, close out, with journal entries, with truing up balances. And if those balances, if those adjustments we have to make happen to be material, we have to report a finding um, because of the way that government auditing standards defines um, deficiencies and a material weakness in this case in internal controls. So this is not a, a situation where we've uncovered any, uh, there's no, we're not, we've not uncovered any fraud. We've not uncovered missing funds, nothing like that. Really, this was just a, a couple of adjustments we had to make to get the numbers reported correctly at year end. And I think, you know, even, even to kind of narrow that even uh, a little further, in, in both uh, cases, we were making adjustments in what are uh, typically known as project funds. So in, uh, in the, the water projects fund, which is this first journal entry that you're seeing here, where we had to adjust, we had some receivables that had been accrued in previous years. And when the cash receipts came in, when we collected on those receivables, they were related to some uh, Department of Environmental Quality loan draws and some grant funds. When the funds came in, rather than reducing that receivable we had set up, they had been receipted again. So we had to make an adjustment to, to, to reduce that receivable balance to get that properly reported at year end. And the second one is in the County Capital Projects Fund, and it relates to the unspent amount of coronavirus relief funds at year end. This, is, this was a, a specific uh, technical issue that the Governmental Accounting Standards Board had to actually issue a bulletin on how to account for this. And, you know, really, at the end of the day, like I've been saying, this is really just about adjusting some numbers and making sure we get them properly reported at year end. And because the dollar amounts happen to be fairly large, they were material, 
and thus we had to report them uh, as a as a finding in the report. The next couple of slides here have to do with uh, recommendations that we make that we issue as a part of uh, what is called our management letter. You know, these are just recommendations, items that we observed as we went through the audit, not, not a not a material, uh, you know, issue or a material adjustment that was needed. Um, and we just these are more just reminders uh, for, for management as we go through the financial closeout process next year. This this first one has to do with uh, the accrued the calculation of accrued compensated absences. We need to make sure that we're including the employer portion of FICA taxes and that liability. The second one here has to do with retainage payable when we have projects that we're doing and we're withholding money uh, from the contractors as we go through the projects. We need to make sure that we capture that retainage payable number as a liability. Again, it was not material for this year, but certainly as a project goes along, that retainage balance can grow. We want to make sure that we get those liabilities recorded. And then I'll stop and I'll kind of focus on this, this, this information technology one here. Um, <clears throat> Really, this we consider this to be kind of an industry recommendation. This is not specific to Montgomery County. If you um, if you you know look at any of our uh, of our government audit reports uh, that we issue, we consider this to be an industry recommendation because unfortunately, um, cybersecurity and information technology, cybersecurity risk, all those things. Uh, are are all need to be forefront when uh, in this environment we're in the remote stuff we're we're looking at new systems new softwares connecting new devices to our systems you know for a long time we could kind of say look a lot of these of these uh, you know cybersecurity uh, hacks or attacks that we saw were focused on fairly large organizations but now because in some ways they've gotten so good at, at doing this stuff. Um, organizations of all sizes are being targeted. So we just want to make sure that, that the county is considering cybersecurity, information risk management when we're implementing new systems, considering new softwares, connecting new devices. If we have third-party vendors that have access to our systems, um, that can take the form of a formal cybersecurity risk management program or even just looking at a, a cybersecurity risk management program and picking out those pieces that we think are relevant and important to us uh, would 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 be a good you know step for for any government organization to take and, and that's why I say we consider this to be uh, kind of an industry recommendation. This is not uh, specific to Montgomery County. We've not uncovered some you know flaw in the IT system. We just want to make sure that we're paying attention and considering all of this uh, as we uh, go through and evaluate operations at the county. And then last but not least here, I've just got a couple of slides. I know I could sit here and I could talk uh, for a long time about new uh, governmental accounting standards, but that's not what you all want me to do tonight. I promise you that. Um, but just to remind, just to kind of say, hey, look, we do have some pretty significant uh, standards coming down the pipe. We're going to work with Amber and make sure that we get those implemented correctly at the county. Um, the GASB is doing a lot of work and considering changing some things. No formal standards on this, this second set of items here yet, but certainly um, they're in the hopper and could be coming out as soon as later on this year. The feds continue to take a lot of action. The Department of Treasury just issued their final rule uh, with regard to the CSLFRS, the Coronavirus State and Local Re uh, Recovery Fund. They just issued that final rule last week. So um, lots of information coming out. The state of North Carolina does a very good job of this. LGC is putting out information constantly. The UNC School of Government is putting out an issue constantly, but we just want to make sure that we're considering all of these things as we receive these funds, as we spend these funds, making sure that we're doing everything uh, right, because there is a high level of visibility on how these funds uh, are being spent. And then last but not least, um, you know, just by way of making sure that you all are aware, we do free um, quarterly continuing education and newsletters for our governmental clients. This, these are sessions that we do for clients only. We've been doing them exclusively over Zoom since uh, April of 2020. <clears throat> if any of uh, the members of the board are, um, are interested in getting the, the mailing that we do for this, when we send out emails, you can get with Amber or Frankie. They both have my email address. We just need your name and your email. I can add it to our uh, our database and make sure that you're getting this. You know, sometimes it's going to be fairly technical accounting topics, which may not appeal to uh, to everybody. But we we do from time to time cover things like 
uh, HR and risk management and budgeting and other sort of non-technical uh, accounting things. So if anybody is interested, please uh, please let us know. We'll be happy to get you on uh, that mailing list. So with that, I, um, I've, I've said a lot. I will unshare my screen and uh, I would be happy to take uh, any questions that anybody has uh, about the audit. So County Commissioners, do you have any questions for Mr. Lyons? Uh, I know that's a lot for your brains to absorb. <laughs> what was all? No. No, Mary, John, anything at this no. time? I'm fine, thank you. All right, well, Mr. Lyons, thank you so much. A lot for us to absorb. Thank you for uh, just plugging through our audit. It sounds like we're in good shape and uh, uh, hats off to Mr. Maness and to, to Amber also for having everything prepared for the county. And we look forward to getting this year wrapped here before long. My gosh, you know, 20, our fiscal 21-22 will be to a close in just a few short months. It just passes overnight. So thank you very much. And, and, <laughs> and, cer and certainly I do understand that it's a, it's a, it's a lot of information. So as y'all are going through this, if you do have anything you, you know, want to talk about or questions you have, feel free, let me know. Like I said, Amber has my contact information. I'm happy to hop on a zoom or a phone call, um, you know, or, 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 or meet in person if you would like to just, uh, just, just reach out and let me know if you have any questions. That would be good. Thank you so much for your time this evening. We appreciate it. And thank you to Ms. Bigger for being here as well. Thank you so much. All right, Frankie, would you like to introduce our next presentation? Be happy to. Um, the county commissioned a study, uh, a broadband study, a year or so ago, just before my time, if I remember correctly. And um, River Street Communications um, conducted the study for us. We have a couple individuals from River Street here tonight to uh, present the findings of their study. And uh, as we all know, broadband is a critical uh, deficiency here in the county, uh, especially as you get into the unincorporated areas. And um, the information I received from River Street was very eye-opening. Some big, uh, uh, a big price tag there, but nevertheless, uh, some information we need to know and some information we already know, and this confirms it, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll let you guys get to the meat of the presentation and I'll introduce Greg Coltrane and Bill Shook Chilato uh, with River Street Networks. Thank you. We appreciate everybody allowing us to be with you tonight. Um, the uh, <clears throat> We had the great opportunity to meet with your county manager and uh, several other representatives from the county a few weeks back, and we were really pleased to be able to kind of dig a little deeper into helping Montgomery County with broadband. Um, Bill Shilato is our business development manager from North Carolina, and he's worked really closely on this project, and I've asked him to run through the presentation tonight, so I'll be here uh, chiming in. Thank you all. Uh, is my audio okay? Yes, yes sir. sir. Is my shared screen up that says River Street Networks? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Excellent. Uh, first, I want to start by thanking the, the county commissioners, Madam Chair, and the commissioners uh, for serving in your role. Uh, we get to see a lot of uh, officials in the, in the work that we do, uh, and we continue to be thankful and appreciative of what you do and the service that you bring to the citizens of your county. Uh, you didn't sign up for some of the events that have been uh, fostered on you, but you've shouldered those and uh, you're caring a lot for the citizens and you're, sh and you're serving in a way that most of you probably never anticipated having to deal with. And so for that, we're thankful and appreciative. We're thankful that you allowed us to be here this evening. We also know that the county manager and the staff that, uh, that serve uh, you and the citizens of, uh, of your county are also uh, dealing with unprecedented events. Uh, this COVID uh, was certainly thrown a curveball at us that nobody anticipated or expected. Uh, we also know that this is new, this telecommunications thing, this broadband thing uh, has come at you uh, full steam uh, in a way that uh, nobody could have predicted 10, 15 years ago as well. So there's a huge learning curve going on and we understand and appreciate that. Uh, we hope to be a part of the solution for you. So this is a presentation by Greg and I. Uh, Greg is the vice president of uh, business development. He, Previously, he was the CEO of 
the Tri-County uh, Telecommunications Membership Co-op in uh, Hyde and Beaufort County area. Uh, and then when he joined with uh, Wilkes Telecommunications, he became the uh, Vice President of Business Development. He really is uh, 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 second CEO for our organization and is uh, an expert uh, in federal and state funding uh, to the degree that uh, impresses even us who've been in this industry for 20 or more years. So uh, jumping into the presentation, uh, as uh, County Manager uh, Mana said earlier that you commissioned us in December, uh, late December, early January to do this broadband study at the cost of $60,000 for a fixed uh, or a fiber to the home, fiber to the premise, they're synonymous terms. Uh, and the fixed wireless portion cost was set at $20,000. We've invoiced and you've paid that early on. And so those funds have already been uh, received and accepted. And so there's no issue as far as those uh, uh, things come up. So in July of 2021, we completed the broadband expansion plan and we had an opportunity to brief Mr. Brian Helms, who served in your IT role and now serving your school admirably well there. Uh, Mr. Ems uh, received that uh, a verbal presentation, uh, and then we also knew at the time that there was some fairly large changeover uh, in the county staff. Uh, in November 2021, Mr. Vanna Heath uh, contacted us uh, with assistance from Mr. Helms uh, and let us know that they were prepared, fully prepared, to receive the in-person briefing. And so uh, Vice President Greg Coltrane and I traveled to your beautiful part of the, of the state. And I have to say, it's been a while since I've been back there. Uh, your county is just a beautiful location. And I enjoyed, again, driving through that area of which I used to fly over uh, when I was serving in the U.S. Army as a helicopter pilot, uh, that you are a national forest and your whole county is just beautiful. So we traveled back there and we were able to meet with uh, County Manager McManus uh, Manus and Mrs. Heath, uh, Mrs. Daniels, uh, Mr. Johnson, I think Jordan Yancey are not with us this evening, but we had a good two and a half, uh, two hour and 45 minute discussion with them. So they heard more from us than they probably uh, should have put up with, but it was a really good uh, introduction for us. So here's the cliff notes for everything that we've done for you. This broadband expansion plan, if you wanted fiber to the home for every uh, person in, uh, in Montgomery County, it's a $42 million plan. Now, without this plan, you really wouldn't know what that number is. And we've, been, we've seen fairly wide uh, uh, cost ranges for doing uh, multiple counties. Uh, Greg, I think this is our 15th or 16th county that we've had the chance to do this review of. Uh, this is probably a, uh, on the lower end of it, uh, and it's uh, uh, many counties are even higher than that. Uh, so $42 million is, will build out of just over 1,000 uh, miles of fiber, and it'll pass uh, almost 16,000 homes or premises. If the take rate's about 30%, then that $42 million grows to $52 million. The good news there is that all of those costs are absorbed by River Street Networks. And uh, we, as we add on new households that are within 2,000 feet of the uh, main lines where we build the uh, fiber infrastructure along main highways, then if the, the house or the premise is within 2,000 feet, there's no cost to the individual uh, homeowner. There's no contracts and we're priced, I think reasonably priced. I'll show you the pricing schedule uh, in, a, in a little bit. So uh, when you uh, add those up, uh, that's additional 10, about $10 million to get 30% of the households. Uh, we'd love to have that many households or more. We also did the fixed wireless uh, plan to get uh, adequate, decent coverage of your county. Uh, we need a, a estimated 26 towers and the cost is gonna be around $10 million. That gives us a coverage areas of about 87, uh, 8,800 households. Uh, then the, uh, the, the, just the nature and the physics of fixed wireless reduces the serviceable locations of those down to 3,228 households. Uh, you're very fortunate. You're in a small group of counties in uh, North Carolina. We all know that there are 100 counties you're in a, a handful or several handfuls of counties with a full broadband expansion plan. Now, what that does is it serves you very well in that 
uh, all the grants that we're going to uh, look at and try to participate with you on uh, would require this kind of knowledge so that we know what to submit on your behalf. Uh, no county that we currently work with has the kind of funds it takes to fund a, a fully uh, fibered solution for their county. No county. They just don't have that kind of funds. So uh, the estimated shelf life of your broadband expansion plan is about five years. Uh, we, we finding that estimate holding very well. And so if no county can afford this, uh, this uh, level of, of, of cost, what are we gonna to do to close that gap or help partner with you on closing that gap? Uh, in doing that, I'd like to just talk about a little bit about who we are first. Our DNA is a co-op. So we're citizens and members owned. Uh, we're not only uh, are the uh, people who take our service our customers, but they're also our owners and our members. So that's our DNA. And we've been around since 1951, headquartered out of Wilkes, North Carolina, with, with approximately 300 or 30,000 accounts, 23 in North Carolina. And we're starting to service Virginia in a, in a big way. Uh, you'll see some uh, plans down the road. We have 146 million in assets. Our annual revenues is growing past 56 million recently and employ a little over 210 uh, employees currently. We're wholly owned, uh, River Street is wholly owned by Wilkes Telecommunications uh, Membership Co-op. And what that does is allow us to work with counties like yours because we're not contiguous with a typical co-op mentality. Uh, we have this uh, for-profit organization wholly owned by this DNA uh, membership co-op, uh, and so we're fully uh, owned by them and controlled by them and mainly funded by them. We service North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia, and some clients in Tennessee. We solely focus, just like we did when we were started in 1951, is to serve the unserved. When they couldn't get telephones, they solved their own problem by developing a co-op, and that's what we're still doing now, and we're doing it for broadband instead of telephone. We thought it'd be helpful to show you some definitions or some terms that we use uh, in our, uh, in our uh, industry that uh, you may not be familiar with you. As you read down those, and you can read just as well as I can, I'm going to talk about this reverse auction concept a little bit because it plays an important role in just a few minutes on some things that I will discuss with you. So this re, uh, think of this reverse auction as a uh, instead of increasing the cost or bid on a uh, on an object, the Federal Communications uh, Commission uh, released this product uh, the, on this uh, funds uh, so that they developed it as a reverse auction, and so they define an area and say we want fiber in this area, we want this in these uh, census block groups is the is the area that we bid on, and you bid. They said, this is how many households, this is with the group. And so each or each round of the auction, uh, eat, uh, the participating groups are bidding lower and lower to accomplish that task. And that bid is how much the federal government is going to have to put in under their funds to get you and to incentivize you to use it. So this reverse auction concept is we bid uh, in most counties and most census blocks groups. Uh, there are some incumbents who bid ever lower and lower to the point where it made no sense for anybody to be bidding that low. And it has, a, it has an impact on you because there were quite a few funds called the Rural Digital Opportunity Funds that you see uh, on this list uh, uh, called ARDOF that were bid so low, but there were a good chunk of uh, Montgomery County that were bid on by these incumbents at a very low rate. And so as you read down those uh, helpful terms, that reverse auction to me is an important element and what we're gonna talk about. So the service area that, that I wanted to show you, so this is where we started. Uh, are you able to see my cursor in around this uh, uh, chopped up donut here that, yes. uh, in yes. uh, Galax, uh, just south of Galax? Yes. Yes. Uh, that's, that's Wilkes Telecommunications Membership Co-op. Every citizen, every member of the co-op has fiber to the home. Wilkes County was the first county to be able to do that. 
Uh, and uh, so the uh, you see the area in the middle there had already been serviced by the incumbent uh, provider there and they had good service. There was no reason for us to build out into that area. So we built that area and all of our, our all of our clients are now have access to fiber. Uh, Greg and his organization did a similar thing down in, uh, in the Hyde and Beaufort County area uh, in this eastern portion of North Carolina. Uh, they also brought fiber to many uh, of their membership corporation and continue to be working to develop that. These other green areas that you see are a combination of uh, fiber, copper, and fixed wireless. Uh, I, meant, I meant to mention earlier, Greg is coming to you from this area down here in Bellhaven, North Carolina. And I'm coming to you from Hickory, North Carolina, where I built and, uh, and uh, organized a fixed wireless uh, region uh, to pr uh, provide broadband to my area. Wilkes Telecommunication purchased us in 2019, us being North Carolina Wireless, for our uh, clients as well as our expertise in fixed wireless to make sure that we continue to build out in a good way. These other areas that you see in Virginia and uh, North Carolina are all uh, areas that are serviced by elements of River Street networks at this point. So a project example of, of, as we look at Montgomery County, how are we gonna put this together? So we took a model like King and Queen County, that's just one county, even though they have two names, King and Queen County. They're a county of about seven, just over 7,000 residents. So it's a small number of population spread over a very large area that's mainly agricultural and definitely rural. So we, uh, we have this issue of them not having much money to bring to the table and, uh, and how we're gonna fund that. So we looked at uh, providing locations of 3,800 households or premises. Uh, the route miles are almost 580 uh, uh, route miles of fiber. Uh, the Connect America Fund brought 5 million, just over 5 million. The RIT is a Rappahannock Indian tribe. They brought $195,000 because they're in that area and they'll benefit from it. The, this county with small amount of funds brought $3,800 to the project. And this organization called Virginia, the VATI, V-A-T-I is Virginia Tele, uh, Telecom Initiative, uh, brought almost $6,000 this. River Street participated at the 3,300 level and the entire project is $18 million. And that's how we funded it. You see this cost per passing. I'm going to come back to that uh, in a, a later slide. This is a reasonable cost of uh, passing, although a little bit on the high side because of the way the, the county is spread out and the, and the uh, ruralness of this county. So this is one way that we might be able to, to structure an org, uh, a funding method for Montgomery County. This is a different slide with the same information. Uh, it shows the percentages that were brought by the federal government. Uh, the Rappahannock uh, tribe, uh, the state funds called VATI, uh, and the local funds, and then the River Street funds uh, at the $18 million. We found a way to fund that, and that project is ongoing right, uh, right now. We had a groundbreaking that was well attended uh, and was uh, well covered by the news media. So this is a broader picture of the things that we're doing in Virginia. So looking at 50 7,699 locations. We're, we have an ongoing project that's coming together right now and funded by all these organizations that will uh, cover those many uh, locations in 16 counties. Uh, so we're upwards of this uh, huge uh, project total cost of 300, almost $360 million. And those are all in the works as we're, as we're speaking now. Greg, is there anything else you wanted to talk about on this Virginia slide before we leave? Yeah, I, I did want to inject that in working with the counties in North Carolina and Virginia, as Bill alluded to earlier, it was really quick that we found out, you know, it's just going to be hard to swallow the elephant. And the elephant meaning the $42 million to build your county. So when you start looking at that and you say, I want to eat it a spoonful at the time, and you've got a provider who has a lot of knowledge and has a lot of experience working with county government, working with federal and state programs to try to go and win grant funds, then if you're successful in winning those funds and county government can match, 
and River Street can match, all of a sudden you can create a business case that makes a lot more sense. So I don't want you to be scared when you look at the total cost to build a project for your county and immediately, um, you know, feel like we just there's we got to tuck our tail and run. There's no way we can afford to do this. You have a way to do this because you now have a complete design. You've got a, a, a roadmap that tells you what to do uh, as far as how much it's going to cost. And then you've got a provider that has years of experience building fiber networks and the opportunity to sit down at the table with you and take you to next level, basically. Um, when you look at the counties here, those counties have, have uh, contributed uh, somewhere around 20 to 25% in the model. And when we approached all the counties, they were like, I don't know how we we're gonna get this done. We just can't afford it. But we, um, over a couple of years working with them, were able to help them figure out a way to secure those funds. COVID, as Bill said earlier, opened a huge door. Um, Companies, I mean, counties all over the country uh, were receiving American recovery money and they didn't know whether or not they could spend that money on broadband. Well, that ruling came out just a few weeks ago from the federal treasury and uh, it's now been uh, addressed and everybody knows that it can be used for all things broadband. And so a lot of counties uh, have had other major important expenses. They've had sewer and water and a lot of issues to deal with and some have already spent some of their money. Others have bookmarked some of their money for broadband, but um, there, there is a way for us to get this done. And the importance behind this model, I know it's Virginia, it's not North Carolina, um, but we moved into Virginia because Virginia's grant programs were heavily focused um, with deep initiatives to try to leverage federal assets, federal dollars that have already been thrown out there on the table. And even though we don't have some of the same offerings in North Carolina, um, Bill's going to talk to you in just a minute about some of the other programs that are coming, and I'll chime in and help him if he needs it. Thank you, Greg. So one of the things we want you to know is that as these uh, ideas get developed and these projects and infrastructure gets developed, pricing is an issue. And so we, as we build out, we look for a take rate. We love 30%. Anything higher than 30% really starts to benefit many, many more people. But the pricing has to be reasonable, and we believe that we're uh, completely competitive in that arena and continue to, to strive to be so. The other thing is, because we have this co-op mentality in this DNA, we've never raised prices. Once we set prices, we don't set an uh, a introductory price and then six months later or 12 months later increase your pricing. So the, for the fiber uh, at uh, 100 by 100 is uh, $95.00. It can be reduced by this low-income lifeline to uh, an 85, uh, 85.75 uh, price point. Uh, we do have uh, intermediate or medium pricing of a 500 by 500. We also have a gigabit service that uh, starts out at a little over uh, $135. Uh, that's the fiber side. On the wireless side, if, if, if it's deployed, you choose to, to us, for us to continue to think about uh, deploying wireless. And we're going to uh, attempt to deliver 25 by three. And that pricing is a little bit different. Starts out at 75 with the low income, it becomes 65 a month. Again, there's no contract. Uh, you, you ask us to provide service to you. We provide service to you. Call us next month and tell us that you no longer want the service. There's no uh, exit uh, cost or entry or exit cost. You don't pay anything up front and you don't pay anything to get out if you want to get out. Uh, hey, we believe that. Go ahead, well, let me let me quickly address the um, affordability uh, yes. process. We okay. have just recently um, applied for the next generation of the EBB program, which was a federal program that was funding fifty dollars for low income, uh, low to middle income families. Um, we've signed up for that program and have received notice that we can now participate. What that program has been renamed to is the ACP program. Um, and the ACP program is going to reduce down to $30 a month. So if you are a low income individual uh, in your household is a low income household and you meet certain criteria, you can sign up and then you'll get a credit on your bill. That takes these packages that you see here and drastically reduces them. In fact, we're getting ready to um, implement a, a low income pricing package, which would give you 50 meg by 25 meg. And that package would be available for as low as $35 a month. Um, and our state is actually talking about 
uh, a stopgap solution to meet the difference between the new $30 ACP plan and the $50 difference that got reduced. And so um, there are opportunities for us to help customers get this service at a very affordable rate. Make good, Bill. Thank you, Greg. So this is the broadband expansion plan that we delivered to uh, uh, Frankie Manis and his, his staff. Uh, it, it, this is the index of that uh, uh, product that we produced. Greg showed it to you earlier. Uh, it looks like that. I think you have seven or eight copies uh, there, and we can provide more if you'd like. It's a it's a document of a hundred total of 112 pages. So we put this slide in there to show you uh, Montgomery County, but how close you are to uh, an organization that that River Street purchased and is absorbing into it. That has telephone, copper, uh, has some fiber, and it has some fixed wireless. And so you're very close to that. Uh, uh, what that gives us is a uh, uh, a jump off point it's always close be better to physically be close to an area that you uh, hope to work with and we certainly have that with uh, lrb telephone there so these are your current on page five you would see who your current providers are centrelink is the predominant one there is as you know uh, it says 940 max download speed and 940 upload speeds. That's a very, very small portion of their entire customer base. They're in 20 uh, of your 22 uh, block groups, uh, but most of your most of the customers who uh, have that service, and many of you probably do, so you know this already, that the speeds you get on the download are six or seven, and your upload speeds are a mega, a mega, mega uh, below. Uh, I think County Manager uh, uh, Manis uh, confirmed that with the, when we had our discussion with them. Charters, your other uh, larger provider there with 18 of the, of the block groups, they do have better speeds on the download, but their upload speeds are limited because they're dealing with the, uh, with the uh, coax cable that uh, used to deliver, only be concerned about the download speeds with delivering television to the households. Uh, with the, uh, the increase in broadband needs now, especially on the upload, uh, they struggle to provide the upload speeds. You have an organization that we are familiar with, Open Broadband is a fixed wireless uh, in, uh, in uh, four of the uh, block groups. We're in a very small portion uh, down there near LRB Telephone. We hope to grow that uh, extensively. And then you're familiar with Randall. Randolph Telephone uh, Membership Co-op, a uh, co-op just uh, similar to uh, what we are at, at our home base. So uh, this is a recap on page nine of the of the miles passed, a uh, little over a thousand miles of fiber in this plan. Uh, and those uh, within 2000 feet, uh, the state maintained road would no cost to them to become members. It passes almost 16,000 households uh, it's a, a G pond, so it's an architecture that is expandable and growth, and it's easier to maintain uh, with being that uh, latest technology. So we've broken your county into nine zones of distributed geographically, geographically. And what that does is if there's some zones or portions of your county that you say these folks have just got to, this area's just got to have it, to meet some uh, goal or requirement of the of the county managers or the county commissioners, uh, then we've broken it down into nine geographical zones for you to show you the cost in those nine zones. If uh, if we want to work from that end of it rather than work at the whole elephant at one time, uh, we do work with qualified instruct, uh, uh, contractors in our efforts. So how much broadband do you need uh, with telemedicine and telework, uh, homework from school or from home now and distance learning, more and more bandwidth is required. So we gave you just a, a thumbnail sketch of, of where uh, broadband used to be, where it's going to. Uh, and we believe that that's the ability to be able to deliver a gigabit to you is going to become even more important, important in, in maybe as, as few as three to four, if not five years. Uh, that 500 mega, megabits per second is probably going to become critical at some time uh, with the delivery speeds and, and, the, and the applications that we can do there. There are many parts of your beautiful county that people would move to if they had access and uh, uploads and download speeds. You've probably heard the stories. Your realtors have probably have told you the stories. So uh, the FCC RDOF funds, Rural Digital Opportunity Funds, uh, is a $20 billion that was conducted in two auctions. Phase one, we fully participated with. 
uh, and nine billion of those 16 billion was awarded. That means 6.8 billion dollars was left on the table, and and it was just uh, I think it's uh, it was a shame that the the auction played out the way it did, and some of the larger incumbents used the the reverse auction in a way that was not as productive as it could have been. Uh, had they played a, a little bit more friendly in the, in the box and uh, and stopped the bidding before it got too low to really ever do anything. Now, the good news is there's a phase two auction and that money will be rolled over to that. But all that did was delay the inevitable of those federal funds coming out to the counties that need this service. So, and Bill, we're actually a little yeah. bit uh, yeah. unsure whether or not there's actually going to be a phase uh, okay. two. All there right. was Thank it you. was supposed to be a phase two auction, but uh, as it stands right now, we're not sure what's going to happen with the new monies that have been in, um, in, um, you know, pushed out the door as so, it gets sorted out. Mm -hmm. So this is a a Macbeer County, and the blue is the the Ardolph funds that were awarded at a very low reserve. Uh, I'd point your attention to that last number, six hundred ninety eight dollars uh, and ninety nine cents per location. That's the that's the, what will be awarded under the, as as the way it was bid the reverse auction was bid so low uh, that we don't see uh, a reasonable uh, way that a organization could roll out a fiber infrastructure to all of those households uh, with that low a bid and so the likelihood of this network happening under this federal funds is very small. And again, a lot of money was left on the table by the way it was conducted. And so a lot of people observed that. I think it'll be better in future rounds, uh, but it does complicate a little bit our activities in Montgomery County in that we have to now deal with this because they've got those funds and they've tied this these locations and areas up for six years unless they release them. And, and that is problematic, uh, I'm sure, in your eyes as well as our eyes. Uh, the on page 28 again we reiterate, reiterate the cable miles that this plan would provide a little over a thousand uh, passing almost 16,000 homes for a cost of 41.7 million dollars uh, jumps up to 52 million dollars if there's a 30 30 percent take rate that would cover 4,797 households we get a take rate of 100 percent again uh, that cost delta between 41 and 75 million would be covered by River Street because we love to add new customers. Again, no contracts, no cost to the individuals uh, bringing those on. So we'd love to have that problem of uh, funding those. Uh, as we move into the wireless portion, we thought again, it'd be helpful to have some uh, terms to discuss. Uh, a covered area is an area where the RF signals will more than likely reach uh, in our propagation studies. We normally have to have sufficient uh, elevation for those uh, access points to be able to give you that coverage area. Serviceable locations or households or structures within the coverage area that are proven to be serviceable. They have a strong enough signal that we can get a signal to them and they can get a signal back to the access point in sufficient strength that will hold a, a good connectivity. And then supportable locations are those that uh, we can do all the two things above them, but it also will not over uh, stretch the access point. So each access point will have a limited number of, uh, uh, of serviceable customers on those. Uh, and, and that is how we judge it. We monitor the uh, number of customers, how much uh, traffic is going there so that we make sure that access point doesn't get overloaded to the point where it's frustrating for people who are on there as existing customers. And an access point is nothing more than a tower, a water tower, or a tall pole that we can operate our transmit and uh, receive frequencies off of. This is the, the broadband expansion plan fixed wireless uh, supposition of 26 elevated assets or access points. And these are the, the generalized locations. Uh, we typically don't try to get them to uh, 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 set in a location because there are many factors that go into getting that location. One is the landowner, the right of ways, all those things that may generally require us to move it to some degree but 26 would generally give you sufficient coverage uh, of the areas that we're talking about and uh, almost 8,800 8, areas, again, at the cost of $10 million to roll that complete infrastructure out. 
uh, would give you, uh, it will cover those who are reported on the FCC uh, uh, reporting uh, of households, about uh, just over 6,000 households that are currently considered unserved, 25 or three or less. That's on page uh, 76 through 85, where that information on the fixed wireless is located. Uh, so uh, during this process, the, uh, federal, uh, the FCC Federal Communication Commission released some frequencies called the Citizens Band Radio Services. Uh, they auctioned off frequencies uh, in that 3.5 gigahertz to 3.7 gigahertz range. What that allowed us to do is allowed us to purchase uh, those frequencies, they're called PALs, uh, and in uh, Montgomery County, uh, we were able to secure four of those PALs. That's the maximum that we could get. That, in essence, give us, gives us licensed frequencies, and that does uh, multiple things to be able to give you better or more service. The first thing it gives us is uh, frequency protection. In the unlicensed arena, which most WISP operated, most fixed wireless uh, providers uh, operate in unlicensed, anybody can throw equipment up and anybody can uh, interfere with you if they don't play nicely and, and follow the rules. Uh, under CBRS uh, frequencies, we're protected from that. And the second thing it gives us is it allows us to use more transmit and receive power at our access points which gives us better connectivity to the individual homes and households. So CBRS auctions and the fact that River Street spent almost $3 million to purchase the PALs for North and uh, County, <coughs> North and South Carolina and Virginia, uh, I think gives us a real uh, good position. So grant opportunities that, that we are aware of and we continue to work with and massage and the rules are being promulgated as we, as we meet here tonight. I just sent Ms. Heath a brand new uh, broadband chart that shows the federal funds and how they're gonna get dispensed and how they can be used. That just came out from uh, a good source for us in, uh, in uh, the North Carolina in Raleigh area. So the great grant is this growing rural e economies with access to technology. It's a program run by the uh, North Carolina Department of Information Technology out of Raleigh. Uh, we know those folks well. Uh, we've worked with them closely, and uh, we continue to assist them with mapping uh, better maps, and uh, it's a good relationship with them. Those, uh, that's an ongoing program that will be released uh, uh, as we go. The uh, bio office is also uh, assisting with the CARES funds. That's the coronavirus uh, recovery uh, funds, Coronavirus Aid Relief and uh, Economic Security Act funds, uh, what CARES stands for. The SFC Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, I showed you some of the ramifications of how that uh, first fund was run. And as Greg said, it, there may be a phase two. Uh, the bio office is uh, developing the rules for the uh, year three grant, great grants uh, as we work on those. The USDA will have reconnect federal funds in 2022. Uh, and the one that we will probably see the most funds come through and have a big impact on Montgomery County is this uh, NTIA uh, funds at $45 billion range. Yes. Uh, North Carolina Great Grant will be at least $15 million each year available for their, their programs. I think it's going to be more than that. We have some charts uh, here that show you, and I'll ask Greg to weigh in on these charts and Help me explain those in a thumbnail sketch, Greg. Sure, sure. So um, there was a little bit of a, of a, a teaser uh, last week uh, where Nate Denny and several others, Angie Bailey uh, from the Broadband Infrastructure Office, uh, gave a little bit of an insight into North Carolina's budget. When the budget was passed this last session, which took a long time, if you didn't notice, um, funds were uh, allocated. We're going to have close to a billion dollars in North Carolina, but the program is currently established based on areas that are 25 and 3 that are considered unserved, while the federal government is rapidly working towards areas of less 100 by 20 considered unserved. So there's a little bit of a delta between that right now, and our state is working diligently to try to work within the legislation they've been given and also uh, make it applicable to federal programs. But this, uh, this program that they're putting together right now has an infrastructure and access piece 
and it has a digital letter literacy piece. The infrastructure and access piece is going to have 971 million and then there'll be another 50 million in the digital literacy piece. But all funds of that um, billion dollars are supposed to be um, spent by 2026. I think by 2024, they have to be um, encumbered. So um, when you look at the great grant program, they have three, 380 million in that program. Um, it upgrades and expands existing last mile grant programs to invest in future proofing technologies of speeds of at least 100 by 20. So in an area that's 25 or three less speed, they're going to offer funds to help get them to 100 by 20 or greater. Um, then there is the Broadband Make Ready Accelerator, which there'll be 100 million in that. And there's the broadband mapping that they're putting a, a million dollars in that. Then there is this new program that's been created. We refer to it as the CAB program. It's the Completing Access to Broadband Grant Program. It'll have 400 million in it. Um, this program is a little bit more interesting because I've not seen all of the rules on this yet, but I think there's gonna be opportunity for us to look at um, some legitimately fiber funded areas. And then the stopgap solution has 900, uh, 90 million in it, and it will be more of a targeted grant uh, process that will allow, I think, more subjective control of the broadband infrastructure office to fund projects that help meet um, getting people broadband temporarily until something else can be made available for them. USDA has a reconnect round three program that's just launched um, a month or so ago. I think the deadline for applications for this is in, um, in February, around the 22nd of February. USDA has been uh, loaning and granting money to people for many years. That's how um, many of the cooperatives existed uh, by borrowing money from USDA and then paying it back at low interest over long periods of time. They have a 100% grant program that's for tribal government. They have a 100% loan program with um, up to 200 million available. Uh, they have a combo where you can um, have a 50-50 match. So you can borrow 25 million and you can get a grant for 25 million if you qualify. So 50 million totally for that project. And then there is a 100% grant program that's um, a bucket of 350 million. And that still requires, even though it is a 100% grant, um, it's interesting. You still have to have a 25% match. So they give you a hundred percent grant for 75%. <laughs> so, um, I know with this particular program, you won't be able to use um, ARPA money. Um, they've been very specific that they do not want to allow that. And we've not seen any changes in their, um, in their opinions of how the money should be allowed. And then really, this is the biggest one that we want the County of Montgomery to focus on. The National Telecommunications and Information Administration is a federal branch called NTIA. Um, they've had a broadband infrastructure program for a couple of years now, and they just we just went through a grant cycle that we're hoping sometime in the next 45 days, uh, we will uh, hear some awards starting to come out. They were supposed to announce awards the end of last year, but they received so many. I think they received four times what they had money for. So these programs are becoming highly competitive. If you'll flip to the next slide, um, this Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was signed into law on November the 15th is the funding mechanism for this. Um, 65 billion was allocated to close the digital divide across um, the United States in all 50 states. Um, NTIA is to administer 48 billion of that money in grants for specific infrastructure. Um, they've written, the written comments for this uh, process or program um, are due by February the 4th, and then it's expected sometime between the spring and early summer that funding guidelines will come out, or they will go ahead and open the window to start accepting um, applications. Potential grant applications are encouraged, uh, they're encouraging us and counties and everybody who wants to build broadband to start now planning for your application, which means isolating what your project needs to be, where's your matching dollars gonna come from. And so I think the biggest thing that we can encourage Montgomery County right now is to start looking at how do you create that bucket of what we call a 20 to 25% match. If Montgomery County was to say, we wanna go through an RFP process 
uh, which I think you guys are working on uh, when we talked to the county when we were there before. An RFP, as you guys are familiar with, will allow you to pick a partner. Uh, you'll receive all of these um, responses back. Everybody that submits an application back to the county will tell you how they think is the best way to get you where you need to be. And then the county gets to choose. And when you select the partner, then you and that partner can go after these programs. And I would suggest that if the county had $4 million that they wanted to put down, then we could go after a $16 million project for Montgomery County. If the county could say over the next three years, and let's say that the NTIA application is a three-year build timeline, it's, it's, it's highly probable that if the county could allocate funds for three years during the build timeline, let's say the county wanted to do 8 million, then if, or 9 million, if the county wanted to do 9 million, they wanted to do 3 million a year for three years, then you just multiply nine times four and that's the size of the package that we could go after. Now there are limits on some of these grant applications where you can only apply for as much as 50 million or 60 million. Um, and that will be uh, laid out in NTIA's program here in the next couple of months. So I, I think the objective today was to help you understand, yes, it's expensive to get broadband to the people in your county. If, if people, if there was a business case to do this, it would have been done years ago. You do have rural digital opportunity fund monies that have been awarded to a, a, a provider in your county. It is still um, undetermined whether or not that project will happen. And if, that, if your county is built with those funds, then that's great because that's going to give your county a huge injection in the arm. But that's a six year build timeline. And that six year clock begins when that provider who won in your county starts receiving their first installment of payment. So if uh, they started receiving a payment um, the end of this year, you know, you'd be looking at um, as much as it might be the end of 2028 before you would actually have customers that would be getting fiber-based broadband service. So there's a lot of what ifs, there's a lot of unknowns, um, but in order for the county to be in control of their destiny, they really could sure up some funds and they could pick a partner and they could go ahead and start working on areas um, that really need it the most. And, and we would love to be able to work with you. Um, we will um, champion an RFP process when you guys put that out in the coming months. And um, I think we are done with slides. And I know we took a little that's while. Case. Greg, I'd make two uh, comments on this slide. One is this February deadline of questions to the NTIA that we feel like that's our responsibility. But certainly if you have something that you want to address, We'll try to address it for you. If not, we'll get those questions or concerns to the NTIA. But that, that February 4th deadline is really on uh, River Street, and we accept that. This uh, timing of your broadband expansion plan is excellent in that these funds are going to become available uh, in early summer. And so an RFP in the, in the next uh, while will be uh, wonderfully timed as well. Uh, and we'd love to be a part of that response to, to you when you uh, probably make that. So th those thoughts come out of it, and uh, we do appreciate your time. Uh, we talked a little bit longer than we probably should have, but we certainly would welcome questions or concerns. So guys, any questions? I know there were some that you brought up when we were together on Thursday. So anything that you would like to bring up to Greg or Bill since we have them in front of us? Could I ask a question? This is John. Yes, you may, John. <laughs> so it, it does appear as though your organization does seek to bring access to remote areas. We're not talking about going to Main Street to provide access because we already have that. Specifically, I guess it goes to the question that, that, that I posed at the last meeting. You know, what is the right answer between the, the 42 million, you know, the, the, the top end of fiber to the home? And I know that at least my interpretation of the wireless network would not necessarily be as substantial as we would like. You know, is there a hybrid concept to, to start this process to go towards what you, you reference as far as those in the most need? You know, in our region being outside of the municipalities, I guess would be, you know, 
is, is there a way to, to I understand the concept as far as we definitely need to get an RFP partner so that we can we can discuss, you know, what type of a match we want to maybe come after these these larger funds to, to, to tackle this huge project. Um, you know, are you able to custom fit? Is it is it an all or nothing concept? I guess. Can you custom fit to where we can start possibly with wireless? to the, the regions that need it the most, or is it a question if we want to go, if we want to go fiber, then we've got to go down that road in the first place. And, and, and there's no turning back from that. You know, is there a hybrid concept between the 10 million and the 42 million? Yeah, so let me unpack some of that for you. Um, you have, in building a fixed wireless network, you have to transport the internet access and you really need a fiber network to transport it. So just as, we all have a cell phone and our cell phones don't work without fiber connectivity um, or a microwave from a tower to another tower that has fiber connectivity. So everything comes back to a landline at some point in time. Mm -hmm. Internet's the same way. So in order for you to have a, a very good, strong fixed wireless network, you would need a backbone in the county. So what we typically encourage people to do is to focus on the build out of a backbone first. And then using that backbone, if they wanted to, if a county wanted to invest in doing fixed wireless, only after we've helped you educate, helped educate you on what you will get and how long that life will be on that technology, it's, it's a holistic approach to building the backbone, getting the wireless in place, going after funds to grow that fiber to that last mile to those homes in the community. Um, you got about a five year life expectancy on wireless technologies before you're probably going to have to upgrade it again. Um, mm. There are limitations on fixed wireless. There are perfectly wonderful options for fixed wireless, but conditions have to be just right. And so when you're trying to address the masses in one area and say we want to try to get this entire area of fixed wireless, we might would have to put up multiple towers in that region to really fully saturate it in order to do so. So that starts running your price up. What we really wanted to indicate to you here is, is that the cost per location to connect customers with fixed wireless versus a fiber solution are all the things you need to consider. And what does that cost look like? If we're gonna spend our money, do we wanna spend our money in a way that we can get people service quickly, but we know we're gonna to have to upgrade it or it's not gonna last very long before we're gonna need fiber form anyway. Every county does it different. We have worked with, we're working with um, over 65 counties in North Carolina and Virginia right now. And out of the counties that we work with, everybody has a different appetite to do this, all the way from the county that wants to fund 100% fiber to every stitch of their customers, their, their um, members of their county, down to and, the, the county that wants to just do some fixed wireless projects. We can do anything in between. So, and I just want to, I want a closing question here as far as what we're, what is a part of the conversation that we're going to be having is basically we're going to need to be looking for a 25% commitment to, to get a part of this, uh, of this, this, this funding process. So we're looking at $3 million towards wireless, or we're looking at 10 to $12 million over the course of the next three to five years of commitment from the county to get involved with a partner to go seek these funds to go one of two different two different options. So we're you know, at the, at the not I guess not the max, but you know if we're going to be if we're going for a hundred percent here, we need to be looking at somewhere around twelve million dollars uh, in the short term, or we're at least going to be into this two to three million dollars to start down this path. Yes, and and I I know you were trying to go in the direction with your question earlier about. We've got Main Street and then we've got the rural pockets. We've already isolated in your study the areas where you already have adequate broadband. So you know where those areas are. Um, our state is working. They've put a million dollars in to enhance the mapping that we have today. Um, there's, it won't be long before we're, we're going to have more information than we can possibly handle about where we need broadband. Um, once we know a lot more about that, which you already guys have in front of you in this document or in a digital document. Um, we can carve out those areas and say, there's no need for us to spend county money um, at a 25% match and go get federal dollars or state dollars. 
to build where where you already have adequate broadband and adequate broadband is pretty much becoming anything 100 by 20 um, or greater. So you can pretty much look at your cable incumbent in the area and you can say, well, in all of our main towns have got cable service and that broadband is great. You know, or if, in, you know, maybe some people have opinions about whether or not the services, the, the uh, customer service is good. The county's trying to get people broadband and um, you need to get the ones who don't have it first. Greg, I have a quick question. So the RDOL funds, so that were awarded, and I know there's a six-year window. So obviously that those funds were to cover, based on the map, too, a whole bunch of the areas that are underserved. And you, or Bill stated that it could be challenging for us to get funding available to go after an option um, in those same areas. So can you just elaborate on that just a sure. little bit so we understand what that looks like, knowing that we're kind of stuck with that unless they're willing to release right, right. those. That's right. So when you look at the cost to build fiber mm -hmm. in an area or a hybrid coax fiber based network, um, we like to consider about $5,500 per customer is, the, is, a, is a good cost to pay to pass that customer. Um, when you look at this slide here that's in front of you, you can see that the winners in this auction are receiving $700 per location. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's gonna put a lot of burden on the provider to build this network. Will they build it? We don't know. They could very well do it. Um, they have deep pockets, um, but they won almost everything in North Carolina. Yeah. And so they've yeah. got the whole state to build. And when they start getting their funds, then they've got to figure out how they get it built in a year. And so That's I'm not, I don't want to bash or talk about anybody you talk down about anyone. They've got a hurdle that they've got to deal with. And it's not just in your county. Will it hinder us from being able to get other funds though? I guess that's my question. So knowing, so, you know, how we go after that through an RFP with a partner, will that hinder us? It, it could very well hinder. Um, as it stands today, the state has already decided uh, that they won't allow any matching dollars from ARDOF. And so they're not going to fund any areas where ARDOF has already been awarded. Um, that's, that's what the current legislation says. So all of these areas that you see in blue today um, would not be applicable for any funding um, in the state. Now on the federal level, some of the federal programs have said that they will offer um, matching dollars to Rural Digital Opportunity Fund winners or they will allow other providers to apply. And if they can show that they would build it faster than six years, they might could still be awarded the money. So within our packet, or could you, is do we have any overlay map that shows what RDOF has been awarded in our area, but then also the underserved areas that would be, you know, so areas that potentially we could look at strategically that are still underserved, that weren't part of the art off, you know, so we, again, if we're going to create a roadmap of potentially how we can make this happen, sure. is that something that would be available to us? It, it can definitely be made available. Um, this, and that would be something that I would suggest that we would look at after you you get through with your RFP process. Okay. But so in between this broadband expansion plan being created for you guys, a lot of things changed. Mm -hmm. um, so we started down the road of putting this together and the, the industry just kept changing and COVID pushed all that. And so when this program was created, they basically went through the state and they said anything that's less 25 and three qualifies in the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund auction. So pretty much everything in North Carolina that was won by this incumbent mm -hmm. um, was all the less 25 and three areas. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the state, there's really... At that point in time, we were sitting here scratching our head because we were saying, well, based on all of the legislation, we just solved the broadband problem for North Carolina. There's no more people, any, anybody out there that doesn't have, that won't have reliable broadband. Mm -hmm. But now the Federal Reserve came back and the Federal Reserve has said, well, the FCC says 25 and 3 is the minimum for broadband, but we really think it needs to be higher than that. So we're going to fund programs to get people um, in areas that are less 100 by 20 
uh, qualified. So federally, there will be money available for less 100 by 20 okay. areas, which could be some of these tan areas that you see inside the blue. Mm -hmm. um, from a state level right now, we don't know how to address it. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you for answering my question. Anybody else? The other no. thing I would add is also these areas that are identified are identified using the old FCC reporting on the 477s. That information is outdated and antiquated. So a, a, a provider could have declared an entire census block served because one household has service in that area. Mm -hmm. They are now funding, you saw the $100 million for better mapping, and River Street participated in some of those uh, efforts to provide better mapping. They're now going down to the granularity where they can pinpoint a house uh, at a specific location and say whether it's served or unserved. And then it may be eligible for funding where that uh, previously had been eliminated the entire census block. So the maps are going to get better, which means there are going to be more unserved, underserved areas that are going to be fundable. And all those things are working for us, uh, even though uh, this bidder has uh, thrown a curve in us with this uh, block of funds. But also, NTIA says that if They've got the award, but we can still award you money if you can do it with three years or less. And so all those things are factors that we would bring to bear on this uh, on this project. Thank you, Bill. Any and other questions? The, and all of these things are still culminating and coming together. Right. So. We so appreciate your time this evening. Yes. Lots of information. Um, so. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for coming to the county too back in December, right after after Christmas and delivering it to that group. And we appreciate the information tonight. You're very welcome. Thank you all so much. I hope you all have a good evening. Thank we you. look forward to working with your leadership. Thank you very much. Our Thank pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye bye, guys. Bye. All right. I think that's all for presentation this evening. Correct, Mr. Manus? That is so correct. We're going to move on. If there is anyone that is on the call, we are moving into our public forum time. Is there anyone that's here to speak during public forum? I don't see any folks that could potentially be that. All right, public forum, going once, going twice. Okay, so no public forum this evening. So, Mr. Manager, I'm going to turn it over to you if you have any manager reports this evening. I do have one item, uh, and that would be an introduction. Uh, Mike Burroughs is joining us virtually. Uh, he's under the uh, uh, Michael's iPhone. Uh, Mike has just started within the last few weeks as our planning director. Uh, we're happy to have him on board. And uh, he will be a familiar face uh, as rezonings and things like, things like that come to your attention. So welcome, Mike, and uh, we look forward to working with you, uh, both on a staff level and on a uh, legislative level. So there's, here's Mike. You got your speech ready, Mike? <laughs> I do uh, have a, not, I don't have an introduction speech, but I did want to say hey to everybody, and I look forward to working with you all. I was definitely well, wondering who that Michael was up in the corner <laughs> of my screen. <laughs> Nice to meet you, Michael. Look forward to working with you. Nice to meet you also. Hey, I think you were going to speak. Sorry. <laughs> or Mary or someone. I heard somebody else. No? I was just going to say welcome to Montgomery County. We're happy um, to have you here. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I love Montgomery County already. <laughs> good. good. Good place to be. It is. <laughs> All right. Anything else, Frankie? Uh, that's it. Uh, other than the uh, standard reports that you have in your packet, which I will do my best to answer any questions you have regarding those. But otherwise, uh, that's it for me. Do you guys have any questions or any comments about the reports that were in your packet? I do not. No. No? Everybody's good? Well, I know that we have covered lots of information this evening. So, uh, many things to get our brains engaged in and, and definitely needs of the county that we've been talking about for a while. So 
figuring out how to, to make all those things come to fruition. But I appreciate your flexibility today. We had to kind of punt with uh, going to Zoom um, after mid morning. So thank you guys for being able to do that. I miss being with you in person, but this was pretty easy breezy as well. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, I do need a motion to adjourn this meeting. To make a motion, we adjourn. So Mary makes a motion to adjourn. I need a second. I'll second. Okay, makes a second. So any opposed to adjourning the meeting? All right, guys, meeting adjourned. Have a wonderful evening and a great rest of the week. And let's pray for no yucky weather this weekend. Right. Let's keep our fingers crossed. So, uh, and Michael, we'll see you soon. Thank you, guys. That was great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye-bye.